I, I, there's a quite a lot to do hopefully if you've got a laptop you could follow along um, in particular there's you should have two two sets of files one of which will be called presentation which will have an index file on so that will look something like this if you click index you'll get to this um, and you'll also have an OVA file which is a virtual appliance for Oracle VirtualBox okay um, so there are a, bu a bunch of different stuff um, and there's the main presentation okay so I'm going to be talking about uh, this is a deep learning talk I'm going to kind of assume you've seen deep learning talks before because um, the, this whole thing has been listed with them so this um, typically for these for talks at Fosasia you might be learning you're either sleeping or you're learning stuff okay if it's a machine learning talk you'll be learning to learn okay this um, because we're going meta so um, so about me so you if you're a member of the tensorflow group which is Sam and I are running this thing out of Google or just have been around you'll you'll have seen me um, I've been in Singapore since September 2013 T -t during 2014 I essentially converted myself from finance guy back to PhD guy um, by doing machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, robots and drones, having a good year out. Um, but since 2015, I've been kind of serious, doing natural language processing, deep learning, um, produced some papers which have been accepted to conferences, and doing a dev course for deep learning. So there's, I'll talk about that later, maybe. Um, I'm currently have a day. Um, we do kind of deep learning consulting, prototyping, does anyone else need one of these? Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a laptop? No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Um, but in terms of products, which is kind of behind the scenes at the moment, we're interested in conversational computing, which is like if you've got a Google Assistant, you kind of know how limited it is. It's kind of interesting, but it's very limited. Um, we think there's going to be like a next. There's got to be a next generation of that. And for that, we're going to need natural voice generation and also kind of knowledge-based interaction. So we're playing with these things. So the idea here is, is learning. You're going to be learning to learn to learn. So I'm going to talk about the basic ideas of learning, um, how you would learn from a lot of data, how you would learn from some data, and then how you would learn from just a little data. Um, and if you've got VirtualBox, you'll be installing the OVA, whatever. So the first thing, though, doesn't require the VirtualBox to be installed. Um, it's if you click on the TensorFlow link in the thing, um, which is here, you'll get up this very simple thing. And it have how many people here have seen the Google Playground, this TensorFlow Playground? Virtually everyone. Do you have a laptop? Do you need one of these sticks? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm, this is this is a, a quick neural network thing. Basically, what we have on this left side is some training data, which consists of these orange and these blue dots, and it's going to try and optimize it so that if you have, give it some test points with the same kind of distribution, it will classify them. And it starts off in a random state. Unfortunately, in this state. It's actually classifying the blue ones with the blue background and the orange ones with the orange background. But if I start it on some other random state, it's going to get it, uh, it doesn't know anything. But if I press this play button, it will then adjust the parameters so that it forms a nice boundary between these two things. So this is, so this is the first part of the, the, the talk in that you have now learnt how to make the machine learn. Okay? So this is one level of learning. Um, and it's a fairly simple, simple one. I just wanted to show that um, you have a task which has some input data and some test data. And this, you know, we, we're going to try and do our best to, to figure, that, figure this out. So let me, let me just... Mark. I'm going to have to keep going. So, um, so with, with this, in, in, and if you're interested in, in kind of the basics of neural networks and you haven't seen this before, this is kind of an interesting thing because you can see that with these features, which is kind of lefty-righty and uppy-downy, you can actually synthesize a diagonal line. Okay? Now that's 
that's fine if I know that a, a diagonal line will work. But if I go to a distribution like this, I know that there's, you can kind of tell, there's no diagonal line which will cut this into oranges and blues, right? Just fail. Okay. And the only way to make this work is by adding additional hidden layers, what, what we call hidden layers. And so what we can do with this, these intermediate things is that they will, they will each produce diagonal lines. And if I can train this sufficiently, it will work out what diagonal lines it needs to make an isolated thing. So here we're doing another training. And it's now figured out that if it picks the right internal features, it can actually draw a triangle around the blue dots, and so it's now learnt. Okay? And if you play around with this, you'll find that there are limits as to how much this simple model can learn, but you can expand it by adding layers or by adding neurons or whatever. There's, there's a whole little playground beautifully done by the Google guys. So. Um, okay, so this is training a neural network to learn. And let me just... Okay, so there's that. And so what we've understood okay, is what the goal here was to learn to predict these regions. You've got the input features. The single neurons can only make a, like a single straight line. Um, the way in which this learns is by assigning blame. But I, we won't get into the whole back propagation thing here. Okay. Um, but also these deep networks can also create the features that they need. So I didn't have to tell it it needs a collection. It needs to make a triangle. That's what it did. It's figured out that a triangle will solve this problem. And if I added more different features, it might solve something else, right? But in particular, if I have a problem where I don't understand the domain, I might not be able to understand what features it should be creating. The whole point of the deep learning is it can do this for itself, okay? Um, if, if you're lucky. Okay, so neural networks next. So now we're on to an, a thing called ImageNet. So this was a huge competition. And how many people here have heard of ImageNet? Fewer, some, okay. Some motion, okay. Um, so ImageNet was a huge competition um, organized, I think, since the 90s even, um, but certainly to 2000s, where computer vision people would essentially battle with each other to try and recognize um, images of, let's say, hot dog, okay? And there would be, in the whole image, images, in 22,000 categories. But the basic game of ImageNet was a thousand different categories. And what happened is that over time, then up until about 2010, people would engineer special features. They would make a, a bread detector and a meat detector and they'd say, well, if the, the bread's going around the meat, then this is a hot dog kind of thing, right? Or if it's got ears, it's probably not a hot dog. So that they would, the feature engineering was all the rage, okay? And then came the neural net people who suddenly these deep networks started to work on this image stuff, partly because they discovered that the GPUs could be applied to doing this. So, so suddenly everything changed, and this is where we started off with this is 2014, there's a Google network. This is now quite a big network compared to the TensorFlow Playground, um, but it got more and more complicated. Um, as this is, this is before the neural networks came along with 25% error rates. When the networks came along, they, and, and it was also grinding to a halt back, back in there. Back in the day. As soon as the networks came along, it fell to 16, then 11, then 7, then 10. It's very rapidly converged to this, which is now almost three years old. This is now better than humans. So this is one thing where th one of the problems and the limitations in learning this task is that you need more and more humans to label this because the human error rates individually will be higher than the network. So you have to have all of these samples labeled by committees now. And the same would go for, say, radiology examples where these radiology programs are better than a radiologist, but they, they, you can't be better than... Um, there's, no, there's no metric to say whether you're better than all radiologists because all of them will be making error rates at kind of the same rate as you do. It's like a battle of the radiologists at that point. So. Anyway, so you also... This is the point at which you now say, OK, I wish I had installed the OVA um, because there is a virtual machine in there which will 
hopefully you can do import appliance on your Oracle VirtualBox, it will then boot into Linux, um, and that will allow you to then go, your host machine that is on localhost, there'll be on 8080, there is a uh, Jupyter Notebook thing. Um, so yeah, basically you'll be able to just open Jupyter on this tab. Okay. Um, hope, okay. The, the, the image will also do other things, so you can SSH into it. Um, so all of this presentations on your in your presentations folder anyway, so you can see exactly what's going on. Um, you can get a console the you know user password are, are in fact user and password. There's a proper ah yes, <laughs> good idea. Um, it, it's got a whole bunch of stuff in here. Um, it's not as, I'd say this one is not as fully featured as it has been in previous years in that I'm really interested in just a few of these examples. Um, I'll be updating this as time goes on because what has happened is that the frameworks have moved on significantly since last year and so are the data sets and for, for reasons I'll explain. So, or well, data sets and models in that the model sizes have got much smaller for, and I'll explain how this has happened, right? Um, and but also new framework has come along, PyTorch, which is kind of a very interesting framework. So I, of course, need to do that. One of the older frameworks, Theano, has been retired. Okay, so there's quite a lot of movement in this whole space. Um, so hands-on ImageNet. So I've got, I've got one of these here. Da, da, da. So this will be under CNN, Transfer Learning, Garas. So there'll be this. So, so just to go back to, to refresh, so this, so under this notebooks folder, there should be a two for CNNs. Within the CNNs, there's five for transfer learning, and then there's this one with image classify Keras. And hopefully, I can find it again. Okay. I will do do this in two stages, um, and what we want to do is. First stage, I'm going to do ImageNet class classification. So this is basically a network which is pre-trained to do ImageNet. Okay, um, these have been these pre-trained networks have been created by say Google or lots of other people who are interested in doing this. Nvidia, even. Um, mainly Nvidia because they want to sell chips, right? They will use vast numbers of images, um, huge computational resources and this will learn exactly the classes which it was told to okay, from all this data. And so if I go through this, basically I'm going to import from TensorFlow, I'll import Keras, which is now a first uh, kind of first order thing. Um, and we're going to be using one of the things in the Keras model zoo. And I'm not sure whether, you, hopefully you can see this, there's a whole bunch of different architectures for doing this ImageNet problem. As, and the very earliest one is this VGG16. Okay, and what, what you can see here is this VGG16, which is more like a 2012 kind of network. It's got 140 million parameters, and it's scoring 70 odd percent. Okay, but what happened as time went on is quickly we moved over here to this Inception V1, which has scored not quite the same, but a huge, hugely fewer number of parameters. And then people started to do trade-offs with bigger models, much better performance. And so there's this kind of frontier as different generations go past of better and better performance. Okay. And so one of the nice things about Keras, which is a, uh, a framework which runs on top of TensorFlow predominantly now, um, is it all of these things in a kind of a model zoo. And so if we, let's just skip over this bit a bit. Um, and so in, inside your, um, Inside the uh, inside the virtual machine, there's these models are all preloaded, so they're they're sitting there ready to be picked up. Um, this NASNet <coughs> mobile model has got in, in, okay, it, it's got 24 million parameters, um, and it takes a little while to load because it's kind of complicated. Um, it's structurally complicated. So the VGG had many many more parameters, but it's a very simple network. It's just do this stuff, then this stuff, then this stuff, then this stuff. Um, this NASNet is m many layers of this kind of stuff. This is very, very interconnected, intricate stuff. Okay. 
OK, from here, having lo loaded this model image net, I have some helper functions to convert an image on disk into something which I can feed into the network. I have a thing which will then get a single prediction. So it will take the image input. It will then pass it through the model to get the predictions. It will then decode the predictions and give it back to me. So if I have a picture of a cat, um, it will do this and it will say that this is 67% confident that it's a tabby cat or a tiger cat. Okay. So this is, there's been very, very few lines of code, but I've been using Google's pre-made TensorFlow, you know, pre-made Keras model. And it works. Um, so the, the VM's got all of these images in there. Um, so I, here's a bunch of others. Um, so it's a Siamese cat. Uh, it doesn't know about white owls, so it thinks this is an arctic fox, or it doesn't really have much idea what this is. <coughs> um, it thinks this is a dingo. I don't think it has a Sheba thingy. Um, there's our tabby again. Okay. So this is this pre-trained model has these categories, and these categories be from the thousand we originally trained it from. And so that this is a restriction. I mean, the thousands quite a large number of categories. It has a few cats. It's got many, many dogs, but it doesn't know much about faces because it's only got, you know, a few varieties of face. Hardly any. I think. I think even Google realised there might be a problem getting us to recognise faces. On the other hand, they also have an equal number of gorillas, which is, has been a problem for them. So, um, okay. So what, what have we what have we just done? Um, We've show, shown that this image net classification, we've trained it from zero using a vast number of images, um, huge computational resources. <coughs> There's an instructions thing on there. Um, if anyone else has got a spare one and needs one, or uh, please switch. Okay. Um, it does exactly what we've told it to because we've given it huge amounts of data. So it may be each of these categories, we've had a thousand images or something. Um, and this is kind of typical and why NVIDIA and the cloud providers are you know, all eager mode about this. Right? Um, now let's do something a bit more. Now, now it, you know, a thousand images is a lot, particularly if you've got a corporate need for doing something. Um, you probably don't have a thousand images, um, but maybe we can do it with 20 images or something. It, it, maybe I could, my product is good enough that if I have, a, or I have a 20 different samples, if only there was some way of understanding images. Okay. So what this, this is kind of a, a nice little trick called transfer learning. And basically, so I'll, so I'll load this other network again. Okay. So basically, hopefully, oh, we, uh, uh, there you can see it. Okay. So this is the image net network. Basically, we have this input image coming in. We have a black box, which is whatever Keras model has been loaded with its own weights. And it comes out with, here's kind of a, a bunch of probabilities or log probs, or whatever, that, that this is the right class. And this is a thousand long. Okay? And then we then take a, like a maximum over this. And the maximum is going to be the answer. Okay? So this will be tabby cat or whatever it is. Okay? So this is, this is the way the image net has been trained. It's been trained. If it gets an image of tabby cat, it should say tabby cat. And it gets an image of, if it says you know, Eskimo or, or whatever, then it's wrong, and you should penalize the network. It should be saying tabby cat. Da, 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 da. So you train this, and it gradually converges to something. What we do in this case for this transfer learning is we use the same exact trained model. We're not going to touch that trained model, but we're going to take off this top layer and just use this answer here. And we're going to pass these answers into an SVM, which is a kind of a standard, like a 1990s kind of machine learning model. Um, and this will then we will then can train this on our classes. So in some ways, if we pass in something which this network has never seen, um, so I produce well, it's seen a parrot, but maybe it's never seen a baboon. Okay, or baboons and orangutans. It may not have that much much knowledge of those, but when it sees a baboon, it will have a certain kind of error pattern. It will misclassify it because it doesn't know what baboons are, but it will like different things about the baboons than it would about the orangutans. So the, the kind of the pattern of errors will be different based upon, is it baboon or orangutan? 
But you can actually take this pattern of error and then use that as input to my, our own classifier. So that's what we're going to do. So basically, a little cropping function, getting logits. So this is the thing which essentially takes off the. We've got the top layer, and I'm now going to produce a thing which is about a thousand big, but it's more like of these error terms. So it's not just a one answer, it's all of the answers. And then we're now going to try and um, see. So I've got a two sets of cars in here called classic and modern cars in just in directories and this what this will do is it goes through everything in the di in in the classes and everything in the directories and just predicts out what the network says and then it stores out that prediction for when I then run an SVM recognizer between the two sets so hopefully boom okay it took 5.8 seconds each so basically this is my training set I've got a classic car Another classic car, another classic car, another classic car, okay. And then I've got, so I've got about 10 of these. Then I've got modern car, modern car. These are sports cars, okay. So what I want to do is, can it recognize the difference between classic cars and classic sports cars and modern sports cars? And these are things it hasn't seen as image and it hasn't been trained on this difference. But there are things about these images that it might like. And in particular, it knows about dinner plates and flowers and so it might like these that the classic cars tend to have these nice circular kind of wheels and these kind of different smooth lines and so it will confuse the classic cars with particular types of flowers it knows quite a lot about flowers or, or, or whatever right whereas the modern cars these are very much more like lotus things or whatever so there's, this is a different kind of flower which is the errors it would make would be different Similarly, they've got different kind of lines and grills and kind of very different feel to it. So you can think that even though it doesn't know about these cars, there'll be stuff which it knows about in images which it, it will make the same mistakes again and again. So that's my training set, the 20 of. I can then train, instead of taking a week or something to train my image net, or it's now the time's going down, but it, instead of taking a very large number of GPUs, I can train my SVM like that, okay? So that took less than a second, okay? So I've got very few examples. I'm only trying to tell the difference between 10 different things, right? And 10 on each side. But then I can then go through a test set saying, well, let's load in each one, um, find the, what the image net thing says, but then use the classifier I just made to classify that is this, is this a modern or classic one, right? So it can then go through this and say, well, this is an image it's never seen before. And it says that this is a modern sports car. So, and this is a classic sports car. This is a modern sports car. Modern, okay. And well, it's a Prius, right? It thinks it's a modern sports car. So it doesn't know any difference um, because it have, I haven't given it the like lame hybrid whatever category. So, um, so it's got these mostly right, but this, mod, this one it thinks is a modern car, which I don't think it is. But, um, so, but we, it's also kind of impenetrable um, how this is working, but it works pretty well and if I would say if you've got a kind of a, a product categorization thing this is what you should use and it's not just me saying oh this kind of idea is what you should use it's not just me saying Google has got this whole auto ML product which they're now selling which is you give it a tons of images um, and they're going to like mulch it with their existing networks and try and classify the stuff as best they can okay so a very very similar principle is what they're using okay and if you want to play around with this, it's quite easy to like create another folder, change the class thing, scratch how to do it. Um, so some guy, so I did this, I think maybe it was FOSS Asia last year or the year before, maybe the year before, some guy actually used this to classify members of his family, which is amazing that it works because it doesn't, the, the image net thing doesn't know much about faces. So this is where also the Google data set, they may have a much broader set than image net they may have chosen stuff which is relevant to lots of different things. They don't tell you what they're doing, right? Um, but they may have chosen their examples much more evenly than ImageNet, which the actual test concentrates on dogs for some reason and, and, and various things. Anyway, may, maybe it was recognized in members of his family based upon what they typically wore or, or the backgrounds they were in or something, which is, um, anyway, it's a, bit of, it's a bit of a trickery thing, but it does, does work. Yes. 
before the support vector machine, or before the software, yes. was it all your network? Yes. Up until that stage? Yes, yes. So there's, there's a Keras, and, and there's two, you'll, you'll see that there's um, a couple of ways of loading the model, one of which is with top, which will actually give you the classification out. And that there you've got just basically the dangling ends of whatever it would, it would need, but then you can then repurpose that to for yourself. Right? Um, so the transfer learning, basically we've used the pre-trained ImageNet model. Um, we're leveraging it to classify these new classes, um, but we, don't, we need hardly as much training data because the network itself knows about vision sufficiently that it, it's got good lead into what we're going to do. Okay. So now let's go a bit meta. We're about halfway through, so that's good. So the previous methods learn fundamentally from kind of large amounts of data, um, but humans learn from very little data. We don't need that much uh, like input. Um, what we would like to do is make models which would also learn from very little data, um, like very, very little data. Ideally, what we want to do, we don't want to have to construct these models. What we'd want to do is make models which learn how to learn that, right? It'd be much more sense if they figured out how to learn that learning rather than me trying to construct something which learns. Because I don't necessarily understand how humans can do it. What I want to do is have a model learn how to do that learning, right? Um, so this is called meta-learning, clearly, right? Um, and there are two main streams of meta-learning, um, kind of, which are now coming to the fore. So one is to learn how to build the best model, okay? And this is called the kind of structure meta-learning. So there's lots of different ways of building these models. But the architecture is really tough to do. And it, people used to say that this is done by um, graduate student descent, in that you'd have graduate students and you'd apply them to the problem and they'd fiddle around until it worked. Okay, and that was expensive, and but it did work. And it, or that that's been the that's been the, the flow of, of graduate students into industry. Right. Um, this we call this structure meta learning. If I mean, a good graduate student will get to the right structure much quicker than a bad graduate student. So he, there's a meta learning process to train that graduate student. Ideally, we want to train a network to do the same thing. Okay. Um, another type of meta learning, and the one I'm going to focus on, is what I want to do is build a model which learns how to solve things quickly. So the model itself um, will be kind of pre condition to kind of like want to learn stuff okay so it's not just set up to, to understand the problem as best it, to, un, to be fitted to the problem is it will understand problems as quickly as possible so okay so what I'll do is I'll, I'll do these in sequence and the first one I'm not going to talk much about um, and I'll show you why <coughs> the structure meta learning basically what I want to do is I want to enable computers to build models um, I, they could do that by searching all the different architectures efficiently um, and then they could hopefully they could guide their own search by predicting what architectures might work well because they've got a history of you know they've got a whole trail of architectures and how well they did work they should be able to say well every time I added a layer it worked better okay so I'll add a few more layers until it doesn't really work so well okay. but the thing is you've already seen the results of this in that is it still open? It's not still open. Oh. There you go. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Let me just... And this thing again. So, I, I said that here's, here's this, this is kind of the original one that was built by, you know, some guy actually in his bedroom. And then, this is, Goog this is a whole bunch of Google engineers and, you know, Microsoft engineers with these ResNets. Um, but then these NASNets is now like the efficient frontier is these NASNets. And the NASNet looks like this. And this was not designed by human. Basically, Google has had this process which would rearrange these blocks again and again. Um, they've given it essentially the ability to look at the, the layer before and the layer before that and just let it go to town, basically. And so they have these normal cells and these reduction cells and they let it their criteria will be I want this to have as few parameters as possible or I want to do as few mobile ops you know ops on my mobile phone as possible but I want it to be as good as possible whereas other ones would be no I want just the highest performance you can give me this is a big network and so this is where 
given that. So the, there's there's a, a Nasnet Large which Keras has, which has got 34, mi you know, 340 million parameters. But I'm just using the, the mobile version, which has got 24 mega parameters, right? So this is something which you can run. There are also even smaller models, but there's you know trade-offs. Um, clearly, Google likes this, um, and so it's probably probably quite a good set of trade-offs at the moment. Okay, so we've already, we've already run one of these models, which has been reduced by architecture search. Um, so the NASNet structure is created by searching over these architectures, and you can actually do these trade-offs power better than humans can, because, well, it's now at the efficient frontier. I'm not really going to talk about this, this isn't really the focus here, um, but we, we, we have talked about it at the TensorFlow meetup, whatever, so, so. Um, okay, let's talk instead about something which is, this is from a paper, essentially this strain, there was a paper which was published on the 8th of March, so this, as I said in the kind of write-up, this is fairly modern um, content. So, one-shot learning. Humans can learn from very few examples. So, if I explain to you about a, f uh, a friend of mine devised a kitchen implement called the hammer whisk, and on one end there's hammer to pulverize things, and on the other end there's a whisk to make delightful meringue. Okay. Now, everyone understands this implement, and you could probably make one, right? And I haven't had to describe very I haven't had to give you a thousand example images or even ten example images of it. Okay? Everyone has in their mind a pretty good example of what, what a hammer whisk is about, right? Um, so that's kind of you, your preconditions to, to accept these new ideas and, and that's kind of, a, kind of a powerful thing. So what we really want is a model that can also learn tasks quickly. Um, and what do we, how do we make something which learns tasks quickly? Well, the thing is that each task well, it, there, I could do lots of different tasks. It's not that I have a lot of different classes. It's each task might only have a few classes, may only have a small amount of data, but I want it to be flexible to learn new tasks again and again and again. Okay. Um, so let's backtrack a little. So regular learning is I have a training set which has a bunch of different classes, and each class has sample images that it needs to learn. Okay. And the test set was, can the model classify previously unseen images? So this is just ImageNet or MNIST or standard classification. Okay. Regular learning. So now we're going to meta-learning. The training set will be a bunch of different tasks. Each task will be a different problem. Um, each of those problems will have a small amount of data. And what I'll say is it would be a successful meta-learner if it could learn each task being a separate training example, right? A training example is a set of different classes to learn. There'll be a whole bunch of little images. It should learn it as much as possible. And then a test set is not a, a set of um, those individual tasks. It's here's another task. Can you learn it quickly? If it can learn that task quickly, then the whole thing, the meta learning has been a success. So this would encourage you we encourage it to both learn how to do a single task as well as possible, but also be generic enough that it can learn many, many tasks quickly. Okay, so hands-on metal learning. So this is in here. Um, and this is called, so there's a directory in there called 8 metal learning. So it's on the same level as two CNNs. There's 8 metal learning. Um, there's a thing called reptile signs. Um, and what I'll do is Hopefully, I can pull this up. Notebooks, metal learning, reptile science. So, um, what we've got here is. I think I'll run this twice. What we've got here is a torch program. So this is so the previous one was using TensorFlow and Keras. This is now Torch. Torch is kind of an up and coming um, kind of. It's like a numpy. It's a very kind of generic toolbox. Um, Google is, is also interested in doing this kind of um, dynamic teaching of these things, um, but they feel like they're kind of coming from behind it right now. So this has been going for just over a year, and it's now kind of dominating research people implementing papers. And so if, if a paper comes out, 
within about two days, if it's an interesting paper, in two days there'll be a Torch version available. Not from the original researchers, but some will just be validating using Torch. Super, it's also a good way to learn. Okay. So what this does is, um, basically I'll, there are two layers to this, because this is meta-learning. So there's an inner optimization. So this is, if I have a single task, how many steps, how many epochs, how many batches, whatever, for this internal task. And for the outer thing is, how many tasks am I going to learn? Right, so each task, in this case, will be, let me just have a task, this gen task. So basically this is kind of, this is the key thing. This is a random task, and I'm, I can generate as many of these random little tasks, and the task I'm going to be trying to solve is, given a, a sine wave of random amplitude and random phase, I'm going to give you 10 points on that sine wave, and I want you to be able to predict other points where they would be within that same sine wave. So if I learn this task well, I will be able to say, well, this is a big sine wave, and it's shifted off by this, and here's, here's good answers for the rest of it. And if I can do that, I will then score on that task. Okay? I'm going to do many, many of these tasks. So this is where I have a little model. So this is some linear things, some tans, whatever. This is a, my sine wave predictor thing. Um, I have a thing which trains the, the current model on this, this current problem. And a little plotting thing. And then this is an outer loop which basically takes a copy of the model, um, runs a training on a random task, and then uses that random training to like build the entire model so it's just more and more sensitive to learning other tasks. Okay, so this is a process which they call, this is an open AI paper, and they call it Reptile. So it's kind of building on this thing called Mammal before. Anyway, so, um, so basically what we have here is this, is basically first step. And you see that the, the ta this is a task from the test set. Now I'm going to only use one task from the test set. Yes, the training set is a whole bunch of tasks. This is a task, I'm meta-learning. So it hasn't seen this task before, and it's been given these 10 points on this sine curve. Network starts out with hardly knowing anything, and it gets trained for like eight steps. Okay. If I train it to eight steps, it gets slightly better, slightly closer to the sine wave. Okay. But this model is, it doesn't actually produce very good answers. It doesn't learn this very quickly. And this will be typical for a model training. But what I then do is I say, well, I, I'll run this kind of reptile process again. Let's say, so now after a few more iterations on lots more tasks, it now is, you can see it's got much more sensitive to learning to get to fit this thing. Okay. It hasn't ever seen this sine wave, this particular sine wave before, but it learns how to learn sine waves. Okay. Similarly with this one, now it's getting quite, quite quick to get up to this. Okay. And so as training progresses, this thing learns to fit the sine wave as quickly as, it po as, quickly as possible. So this is a, a meta-learning, and it's learnt the task of learning sine waves as quickly as possible. And so this is kind of something where you know, the sine waves aren't that beautiful an example, um, but this is, well, it, you can see now from a, a network which starts off hardly knowing anything when it gets presented this new test example, in a sense it's probably starting off more neutral than before because it's, it's preparing to jump the, the quickest it can, right? And as soon as it does that, it then jumps to learning as much as it can about the sine wave so it can give you answers on this new task. Okay. So that was metal learning on this kind of reptile thing. So what we've seen is, is this, what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn to learn tasks quickly. Each task in the meta training creates this sine wave with a random amplitude and phase. The training data is just a few points within that. And we're testing to see whether it learns the sine wave within that task. But the meta test sees whether the single task gets to learn quickly. Okay. Um, and so there's, there's, a, there's a paper, there's a blog post, this is kind of nice, um, but it's, you know, this, you're now learning to learn to learn. Okay. Um, so now there's another one called, and this is where it would work even if you don't have the open, the, 
virtual machine thing going because it's just a JavaScript presentation, a JavaScript thing. Um, the, there's a thing called three boxes. Now, what this are, so here we have three boxes and this is my input. And so let's just, let's just clear it all out. And now I'm going to, so this is a basically um, has been trained to learn to learn, okay? It's all in JavaScript, so there's basically they've built this model, the OpenAI group built this model in TensorFlow, exported it to a JavaScript front end, so this can now run on any browser anywhere, and it learns to learn things quickly. So, um, so I don't know what it will, so, so I'll just, for argument's sake, I'll say A, B, and C, okay? So we could, this is a task. Okay, I've just given it one example of three different classes, and I will now ask it to classify. If I if I write C, or if I write half of a C, oh, it thinks it might be an A. Okay, but if I complete the C, it thinks it's 99% C. Okay, so it this model lear has learnt from one shot learning for these three examples. Now, if we if we start slightly more, uh, okay. It likes A, doesn't it? Okay, great. So this is learned quite well, or, or we can do like, here is a fish, here is a cat, okay. And we've got a mouse. Okay, so there's another set of three. This is my new task. Um, what I could do is I could do this. Oh, I think it's fish. Wow, okay. What if I do this for a mouse? Mouse. Okay. So it's learnt... Sorry. The pre-trained network is, is ready to learn these things super quick. And so this is a one-shot learning which it learns in, the, in your browser. And you can play with this. This is quite a nice little thing. And so let's see how they do that. Um, so they're using something called the Omniglot data set. So the question is, how do they learn this task of learning tasks, right? Or how do they learn the meta thing of learning tasks? And the, what they have trained on is a thing called the Omniglot data set, which has got, um, oh, I've got, okay. There's a nice image of this thing. Basically, it's lots of little symbols. Um, Uh, but it was quite difficult to find. Basically, it's in, in lots of different character sets, they've got people to draw little symbols. So it could be the English data set, it could be um, no, Hiragana, it could be um, no, Tamil, all these different things. Greek, Cyrillic, da da da. They've got lots of different people to write out these things. Um, but there's a, oh, 1,600 of these different symbols. Um, now, each of the these characters was drawn by 20 people. So it's a very, very broad set of characters drawn by rather few people. So this is the opposite of MNIST, where MNIST is you've got 10 characters, 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 9, um, drawn 5,000 times. Okay, so MNIST is kind of the standard task that people will do. Um, what you have with this Omniglot thing is you've got lots of symbols drawn by only a few people. And so if you can learn to do Omniglot well, you're probably able to learn the difference between other characters drawn by people. And that's exactly what I'm doing, right? So, so what we're doing is this one sort of classification. Each of these tasks trains on just one example for the three classes. The model is pre-meta trained on Omniglot. The actual model's running in JavaScript. Um, you provide a meta test task because you give it a task it has never seen before. And you're happy to play with this, right? And it works pretty well. So, um, that kind of explains what this whole game has been. Um, the the, the wrap-up is kind of that this field is advancing extremely rapidly. I mean, models which I had last year or the year before are now just missing from the, this whole... It's hardly worth including them, because it's just bulking up the um, the virtual thing for, for no gain, right? The, the NASNet is extremely small, designed by computer, um, is what you'll all have in your phones with the next Android update or whatever. Right? Um, on the other hand, this stuff is still within the grasp of individuals. The open AI thing, you saw it learning the signs thing. Learning the Omniglot thing is probably overnight on a, on a single GPU. It's not like 
you don't need Google scale to learn this stuff. Um, so it's still entirely within the grasp of individuals to do. And so, well, Sam and I have been playing with voices, right? It's still entirely possible um, to at least get your, your feet wet with this stuff. Um, so it's, it's very exciting. So um, The other thing is that open source really applies to the research field here as well. In the, all of these papers, even though Google really has commercial interests in this stuff, they're publishing all the time. Um, now, it may be that, I mean, the, one of the criticisms is that their papers don't exactly explain what they're doing, right? Um, or the deep mind papers are kind of notorious for claiming quite a lot and not really giving you what. On the other hand, if you're persistent, you can probably, and you corner someone at one of these conferences, you can probably find out what they're really doing. Um, but at least it has the impression of, it, it is all out there, and you can replicate these things or fail to replicate these things and then criticize as the researchers will say, oh, you're, you know, you're kind of doing it wrong, why don't you try this? Or, you know, or this involves a hyperparameter search using 800 GPUs, you may not want to do that, right? So, okay. Um, so just, there's some kind of adverts here. So we have a deep learning meetup group, which is a TensorFlow group. Um, next meeting, I think, is like the 19th. We're, we're, there's a twiddle there, because we're not exactly sure. It's held at Google, which is kind of one of the dependencies. Um, we, we typically have a talk for people who are starting out, um, someone from the bleeding, something from the bleeding edge, this would be pretty bleeding edge, um, and lightning talks. So we had a meetup, I guess, on Friday night. We, we had some Googlers, because they're in town, someone who was interested in implementing stuff on a Raspberry Pi, and someone who's interested in implementing stuff on the cloud with Horovod and, you know, um, infinity bands and stuff. So there's a whole wide range of interesting stuff going on. Um, we've got 2,400 people in that group, which is now the Singapore has the largest TensorFlow group in the world, which is kind of excellent. Um, we've also got uh, a deep learning jumpstart workshop, which is we're doing with SG Innovate. If you go on the SG Innovate site, they've you'll f eventually find this thing. Um, the cost of this is, is like 600 bucks, but there's like deep discounts for Singapore's PRs. Um, and this will involve like a full day at the weekend with like a download of information, possibly starting out from zero. Um, you get to play with real models, kind of like what we've been doing here, but you, you will be forced to do it rather than just sitting and listening. Um, and then at the end of the day, it's going to be pick a project that you can do yourself. And that the whole point is we will then have two more follow-up sessions where kind of you should have done your homework. And if you haven't been able to do it, we'll kind of fix it so that it's going to work kind of thing. Because it's, it's one thing just hearing about it and clicking through a notebook. And it's another thing actually making it do something. Um, and so there's a lot more learning. The frustration in programming is the real learning experience. Okay, it's just it's okay to do the MOOC, but it's kind of handed to you. But the, the banging your head against the wall is a... Um, we've also previously held like an eight-week deep learning developer course, which was all done good. We hope to do another one of these again, but it's kind of pending the funding situation because Singapore is extremely generous with funding for Singaporeans, but it's a double-edged sword. You also have to deal with the government, which um, has its pluses and minuses. So, um, okay, I'm open for questions. And just about on time. Thank you. Fire away. Or not. Yes. Can we do the, the, the last, uh, like the red dot scientific images? Right, so, so this is where they, I believe they've also done it with big stuff bigger than Omniglot. But they're not going to be downloading that. The so the, an, an ImageNet style network will be naturally much bigger to a JavaScript thing. So so yes, I believe that they're in their reptile repo they have image network as well. So this will learn to tell the diff. Given three ImageNet images or whatever, you will learn to do that classification as quickly as it can. So it will learn to do classification of arbitrary images as quickly as possible. I think there may even be pre-trained networks for that. But you're, you're getting into, you know, this, this work is 
less than three weeks old. Okay, so <laughs> this is fairly, fairly new. So, and so if you're playing with it, then you're one of very, very few people playing with it. Right? Yeah? Okay, so I'll, be, I'll probably hang around outside for a bit. Um, very, very happy to answer questions. If you've got one of the USB keys, can I have it back, please? Um, we've had excellent return rates in previous things. Don't let Singapore down. So, um, so there we go. Hopefully you've, you've learned to learn to learn.